Hey guys, what's up? It's Mr. Graves here, trying to help you out as much as I can. Get ready for your micro econ part one test coming up on Monday. So this is all you need to know, or at least most of it, as we go through our uh, most recent unit and review all this good fun stuff. So let's check it out. First, let's start with the fundamentals. We don't want to forget the basics here. What is the study of economics? Please remember, you're going to need to know this for every test. The study of economics is meeting unlimited wants with scarce resources. We have unlimited wants, but limited resources. That's scarcity. Uh, and really, what economists do is they study how to meet all those unlimited wants people have with the limited resources at our disposal. Uh, the fact that we must deal with scarcity forces us to make choices constantly. Those choices are typically referred to as trade-offs, the choice that one makes whenever making economic decisions. So uh, really this comes down to the idea of opportunity cost that we've discussed ad nauseum, which is the cost of the next best alternative when a choice is made. Uh, it could be money, it could be time, it could be resources. So on Wednesday, I had a Falcon meeting at 7.30. You guys don't like to get up and go work out or run in the morning. But since the Falcon meeting was 45 minutes before I'm supposed to be here, I had to decide, do I want to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, even earlier than I normally do, and work out then? Or do I want to run in the afternoon when I get home, which will cost me some extra work time? I have to leave work early, and I have a lot of stuff to get done going out of town this week. So the opportunity cost of me deciding to sleep in was the extra hour after work that I could have spent at work getting stuff ready for next week. So opportunity cost, there we go. Uh, let's skip ahead to some stuff that we need to know for this particular test. All right. Okay, so here's the stuff that's going to be actually on this test. Most of the test is about all this good stuff, micro econ. So let's start with supply. The law of supply, we've talked about this a ton, says as price goes up, quantity supplied will go up. As price goes down, supply goes down. It's a direct relationship with price and supply. The reason that is, is, is producers, they want, the whole reason they're making these products and producing them is they want to make money. It's a profit motive. So as the price of the goods goes up, they want to supply more of it because if they sell those goods at that high price, they make more money. As price goes down, they're not going to make as much money, so they're not going to be producing as much. So supply goes down. Direct relationship. Price goes up, supply goes up. And the supply curve is a positively sloping curve that illustrates that. So you can see as price goes up, so does the quantity supplied. There you go. That's the graphic representation. What, what the law of supply tells us is that as supply goes up, or as the price goes up, supply goes up. But what it doesn't tell us is how much does supply go, go up? What is the degree of the increase in supply when the price goes up? Elasticity tells us that. It tells us exactly how much does price go or does supply go up when the price goes up. Supply can have elastic or inelastic. Uh, it can be elastic or inelastic. Let's just keep it at that. So if it's elastic, when prices rise, the, the supply rises considerably. It's a big rise. And this is what an elastic supply curve will look like. It's more horizontal. As price rises even just a little bit, if it goes from this point to here, you see that that's a small increase in price. That's not much, but the increase in the quantity supplied is pretty significant. So that is an elastic supply curve. Now, inelastic supply curve is the opposite. When prices rise, so if we go from price zero to price one, the price rose, but there's not that much of a change in supply. So that's an inelastic supply. Okay. Uh, now let's look at law of demand. Law of demand is the opposite of the law of supply. As the price of a product decreases, the demand for the product will increase. It's an inverse relationship. As, pr as the price goes down, demand goes up. Okay. As price increases, demand goes down. It's an inverse relationship. Think about it. If you're a consumer, if the price of your, let's say the price of your favorite drink goes up, well, you might want to go buy something different. You might buy less of that good because it just it costs more money. You only have so much money to spend. So price goes up, demand goes down. Price goes down, demand goes up. If the price of your your favorite drink goes down, you're much more likely to buy it because you can buy more of it. So demand would go up. Inverse relationship. So graphically, this is what it will look like. A demand curve is negatively sloping. So price is at six, demand is only one. As price goes down to one, demand increases to six. It's the law of demand. But if prices were to stay the same, 
what then could change demand? So if price doesn't change, so let's go back here. We've talked about this before. If price changes, you're going to move along the demand curve either up or down. So if the price goes down from $3 to $2, well, the, the change in the quantity demanded is going to be shown by a movement along the demand curve. It's going to go down the demand curve. If the price changes from $1 to $2, also going to move up the demand curve there. So that is what happens when you have a change in price. But there are things that can change demand that don't necessarily involve a change in that particular good's price. These are called the determinants of demand. They determine what the demand for a particular good is, but they don't involve a change in price. These determinants are consumer taste. So if your taste or preferences for a particular item change, that could shift demand to the right or to the left. If you shift the demand curve to the right, then that's going to be an increase in demand. If you shift to the left, it's going to be a decrease in demand. The size of the market can also change demand. The more people there are in a market, the higher the demand because there's just more people that want those goods. The fewer the people, the lower the demand. A change in consumer income. If we make more money, we our demand's going to go up because we have more money to spend. If we make less money, if we lose our job, demand's going to go down for most products because we just don't have as much money to spend. The price of related goods plays a role. Is it a good complementary? Is it a substitute? That can absolutely play a role. And then our future expectations as consumers. Do we expect to make more money in the future? Do we expect to get a raise at the end of the year? Uh, those types of things can impact what your demand is and what it's going to be. So let's talk about some of these uh, prices of related goods. So a complement it goes along with the price of related good. Complements are goods that are related. You need to have both in order to use them. If you have an iPhone case, well, it doesn't do you any good unless you actually have an iPhone. So those would be complements. Having an Xbox game does you no good unless you have the Xbox console. They're complements. They go together. They're related. They go hand in hand. So. For compliments, I know this is kind of an old school example because people don't really use DVRs near as much as we have all the streaming devices. But if the price of a DVR player goes down, then the demand for DVRs goes up. Okay? So think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. I, I don't really love that example, DVR players and DVRs. But as the price goes down, remember demand goes up. So if the demand goes up for that particular good, then the demand for its complement that goes with it, that goes hand in hand, is also going to go up. Here's probably a better example. If the price of the Gillette razor handles, the handles itself goes up, then the demand for the razor blades goes down because they go hand in hand. If you have the Gillette razor handle but you don't have the razor blades, it does you no good. You have to have both. They go together. So if the price, remember the law of demand, if the price of the razor handle goes up, that means the demand for the razor handle will go down. Well, if the demand for the razor, razor handle goes down, that also means if it's a complement, the demand for the razor blades goes down. If people want fewer handles, they're not just going to buy random razor blades with no handles to go with. So price goes up for handles, that means this demand goes down. If the demand for handles goes down, the demand for the razor blades, since they're complements, will also go down. Now, the reverse of that is a substitute. Uh, the demand for a product tends to decrease if the price of a substitute decreases. So let's think of some substitute products uh, like butter, okay? Butter and margarine, they are basically the same thing, all right? If the price of butter goes up, that means the demand for butter is going to go down. So if the demand for margarine, if margarine is a substitute, when the demand for butter goes down, the demand for margarine goes up. Just think about it. If the price of butter goes up, you're like, dude, I don't want to spend all that money on butter. I'm just going to go buy some margarine. It's cheaper. It's basically the same thing. You can substitute the margarine in for the butter. Okay, here's another example. If the price of sugar goes up, then the demand for Splenda, which is like manufactured artificial sugar, will go up. So if sugar costs more money, the demand goes down. Don't want to spend as much money on sugar, but I still want that sweet taste. So let me find a substitute for sugar, like Splenda, an artificial sweetener. That will the demand for that would go up. They're substitutes. Okay. Uh, remember, the word utility means the extra usefulness or satisfaction you get from consuming one more good or service. So if you're eating a lot of pizza, if you're, if you're uh, having a, trying to eat a large pizza by yourself, and you've eaten seven pieces, you've got that eighth pizza left there, you, utility would be the benefit or the usefulness, the satisfaction you get from eating that one more piece of pizza. So um, anytime you see utility or marginal, it kind of means the same thing. So marginal utility is the extra usefulness or satisfaction you get from consuming one more of that unit of whatever good or service it is. So the idea, though, of diminishing marginal utility is the more we consume something,
the less satisfying or useful it becomes. So like if we eat three or four pieces of pizza, we're like, yeah, dude, this is really good. But the more pizza you eat, the less satisfying each piece gets because you get full, you get tired of it, you start to feel bad. Like, dude, I think I'm going to be sick. I'm going to throw up. So at some point, while you're enjoying the first piece of pizza, you really enjoy the second piece of pizza, you really enjoy that third, maybe even the fourth, but as you get to five, six, seven, eight, you start to feel sick and your marginal utility starts to diminish. It goes down because you don't feel as much uh, satisfaction from consuming that additional unit. Let's talk about this. If prices stay the same, what could change supply? So we talked about the changes in uh, the, the, the determinants of demand. So let's talk about the determinants of supply. So this is not dealing with price. If you change price, it moves up or down the supply curve. But there's some things that can change that don't deal with price. And that is, those are the determinants of supply. A little bit different than the determinants of demand. You get the price of resources, which is like resources are the things that you use in producing the goods. So if you're trying to make ice, or let's say if you're trying to make cookies, well, the ingredients you need, the resource that you have to have in order to make the cookies, you have to have sugar, you have to have chocolate chips, you got to have flour, you got to have an oven, you got to have all those things. You got to have workers to make the cookies. So all those things would be the resources that you use to make the particular good. So if the, like the price of sugar goes up, for example, then that's going to cause a decrease in supply because the price of the resource went up. Price of resource goes up means you don't have as much money to spend or you can't buy as much sugar, which means you can't produce as many cookies. Uh, technology, if you have uh, a new innovation in technology, you buy a new piece of uh, equipment that will help you produce more, that will cause an increase in supply. Competition, the more suppliers you have on the market, the higher the number of suppliers, the higher the supply. Just think about it. If you have three shoe companies on the market, you're not going to have as high of a supply as you would if you have six shoe companies on the market. The more companies you have out there in the market, the more competition, the more companies are actually producing things, supply goes up. The price of related goods also plays a role. Uh, producer expectations. So do you think that with the fall and winter months coming up, that consumers are going to be less likely to buy shorts and more likely to buy jeans? So you're going to stop making shorts for a short period of time and start making more jeans? Uh, that would obviously impact supply. And then there's government intervention, government tools. Governments can tax, they can regulate, they can subsidize. If a government taxes a, a, a company or business, that means they're taking money from them. So the company has less money to spend trying to produce the goods. It means that's going to be a decrease in supply. It's going to be a leftward shift on the supply curve. On the other hand, a subsidy is when the government is giving money to a company or to an industry. So if they're giving you money to make products, you're going to have more money to make uh, all these products. So that means that you can produce more, which is going to cause a increase in supply, which would be a right shift on the supply curve. So here's the supply and demand curve. Remember point E here would be your equilibrium price. Sometimes they call that the market clearing price. So it clears the market. This is where supply and demand meet. Got to know that for the test. Uh, let's talk about price real quick. Who gets to set prices in a market economy? Well, prices are set by supply and demand, consumers and producers. Prices are the result of the competition between buyers and sellers. Okay, It's all about supply and demand. It's where the prices come from. Uh, the price system gives us a lot of benefits. It gives us information. So if we know how much a good costs, we say, okay, I can compare the price of this good with the price of that good, and it helps you make choices. It gives you incentives. Um, and it, like I said, it also gives you choice. With the information you get, you can make choice. You can be more efficient. So if you have $100 to spend in your budget, well, with each good having a certain price, you can be efficient in how you actually use your money. And it gives you flexibility. Uh, if you if you know a good's price might go up in a couple months, you can buy it now. If it might go down a couple months, you can wait and buy it later. Just depends. So there's a couple benefits there. But there's also some limitations of a price system. These are referred to as market failures. Uh, an externality is an example of a market failure. So remember, an externality is where you have a third party who is influenced by an economic transaction when they're not directly involved in it. So uh, my neighbors, for example, uh, they are my old neighbors. They, used, they bought a bunch of stereo equipment from Best Buy and they brought it to their house. I'm not involved in that transaction, but I was impacted by it because they played music all the time and it destroyed my brain. So that would be an example of a negative externality. Positive externalities also exist. Uh, public goods and instability would also be examples of limitations of the price system. So like we said, externalities are the unintended side effects that either benefits or harms a third party. Uh, here's an example of a positive externality. So for example, a new airport was built. Restaurants and hotels near that airport see an increase in business. So, because all these people are going to be coming to the airport, 
which means they're going to stop at all these restaurants, all these hotels along the way. So that's a positive externality for the hotels.